And so, with that intensive morning of sleuthing and poking our nose where it doesn't belong out of the way, I am feeling a little peckish. And if you're ever in Mazurna Falls looking for a quick and tasty bite to eat, there is only one place to head, and that is right here to the Heinz Diner. Located smack dab in the middle of Main Street, I would say it's actually pretty comparable to the Double R Diner from Twin Peaks. It's got some snazzy tunes playing on the jukebox, nice 50s, 60s era diner motif inside, and it's got the friendly waitstaff of Lorraine ready to fill your order. Yeah, I'd say Lorraine is pretty comparable to Shelly from the Double R Diner in Twin Peaks. She is a pretty nice and personable person with, I'd say, one major character flaw, and that is her choice in men. It seems she is dating Mel, and they have a pretty contentious relationship. But before we can start enjoying our meal, there still the opportunity to get some investigative questions out of the way. First we want to check up and see if Lorraine knows Kathy, and pretty much much like everybody else in town, uh, nobody really knew Kathy. She was just that girl at church. And there is, you know, there's still the possibility in our mind that there is some connection between Kathy and Emma's disappearance, but... Yeah, much like Liz, Lorraine had no idea that they could have even been friends, so that's a, that's a bit of a dead end until we can find someone a little bit closer to Kathy, I think. Beyond that, though, Lorraine does have a little bit of insight in the fact that it could be that Kathy and Emma were maybe closer than we might have thought. Maybe not in a physical sense, but at least in a personality sense. Yeah, Lorraine seems to have gotten the impression that both of them were pretty enigmatic, and maybe people never ever got the full, you know, scope of what either of them were ever thinking. And while we definitely know that to be true of Emma, I, I don't think we've ever gotten that impression of Kathy. Problem is, before we can continue that line of questioning, Trouble walks into the door and takes a seat at the bar. Yep, it is local bad boy that we've heard so much about, Mel. He is, I'd say, analogous to Bobby from Twin Peaks. He is a rebel without a cause, a local delinquent through and through. And What's a bit different from Bobby is the fact that it mentions that he is Dennis's only child. We don't know who Dennis is just yet, but we will learn who that is pretty quickly. Yeah, speaking about being highly irritable, Mel definitely has a bee in his bonnet this morning. He wants nothing more than to get out of the diner as quickly as possible with Lorraine. Problem is, it looks like Lorraine is pretty much going to be stuck working late. Her dad's not here to cover the rest of the shift, and I, I guess the Heinz Diner actually should be the Haynes Diner. Maybe, maybe it's just a slight mistranslation in the uh, the signage. But yeah, Mel thinks that she should just shun her responsibilities and uh, you know close up shop early, and that they can go have a, a early afternoon drink. But Lorraine just wants to continue working and talk about whatever is bothering Mel. And well, Mel, I mean, he's at least willing to open up a little bit about what's you know aggravating him so much. It just so happens what is aggravating him is the fact that he had to get interrogated by Morgan about Emma's disappearance. Yeah, we learned about that a little bit earlier on in the day, and we can kind of eavesdrop pretty easily here to figure out what they might have been discussing behind those closed interrogation doors. Indeed, it does seem like Mel was the last person to see Emma. And obviously, since Matthew, with his complete 
cognitive knowledge about being a good detective, he makes himself super obvious on about what he wants to know about here. And obviously, Mel, like any reasonable person, would want to know why he's being questioned by another local teen. And, I don't know, uh, strangely, Mel, I mean, is at least willing to give us a little bit of something to go on here, which is a bit odd considering his demeanor. Maybe he just has this impression that if he gives us a little bit of something, we'll leave him alone. And the good thing is that once uh, Lorraine learns about the fact that, you know, Emma and Mel might have been hanging out, she definitely wants to know as well. A little tinge of jealousy there. And it's with that that Mel finally decides to cave in and admit, well, they weren't meeting, they just call each other in passing. And where they saw each other is a location we don't know by name, but we've definitely passed through it. You might recall whenever we were going up to the church that we did pass through a tunnel, and I guess that is Cochlands Peak. And while Mel and Matthew, or while Mel and Emma didn't really talk directly, she did for some reason mention that she was going to the church. Seems a bit random, because I, I don't really picture Emma as a church-going person, especially not at 10 p.m. at night. But maybe there was a Christmas mass or something going on. But it's with that that Mel kind of has had enough of the interrogation for today. And I guess he, he just decided that he's just going to go drink by himself. It's, it's all very James Dean, rebel without a cause. You're, you're tearing me apart, Lisa. Oh, wait, that was the room, wasn't it? Close enough. But that at least gives us something. I mean... It is a bit strange that Emma would have been heading to the church and was at was out that late, heading in that direction, because, yeah, I mean, that's on the completely opposite side of the town from Barrow's Forest, where Kathy was found. I mean, I guess Emma could have been going to the church to find Kathy? Uh, I don't know. Thing is, we can actually talk to Lorraine a little bit more to maybe gather our thoughts on this a little bit, you know. And she seems to have a similar line of thought to us. I mean, if we if we were looking for Kathy, I'd guess we'd go to the church to find her. But I don't. We still don't know why Emma would have been looking for Kathy. I I mean, I suppose they could have met up at the church and then headed to the forest together later. So there, there's still no real reason why they would have. Also, by talking to Lorraine a little bit more, we learn that there is some worker strife at the Aston farm. And it seems that the farm workers are, are not super happy with their current living situation. As you can imagine, some of the workers are from out of town. They only have, you know, temporary set-up, you know, lodgings, uh, Furbished by the uh, Dennis, Mel's father, who is also the owner of Aston's farm. And it also just so happens that the workers' lodging is all the way up in Cochland Peak, uh, Cochland's Peak as well. Probably head up there at some point, especially if we ever had to head back up to the church again. But it does seem pretty common knowledge around here that the, that the lodgings are in a pretty dire situation. They could definitely be refurbished. And, well, it definitely seems like Dennis and the Aston family are rolling in money, so that shouldn't be the holdup for uh, repairing the lodgings. And 
And I guess that might explain Dennis's, I guess, spoiled brat, rebel without a cause behavior. You know, with his family being rich and everything. But with that little bit of dialogue out of the way, we do learn now where Dennis's house and the Aston Farms are. They're in the uh, lower left-hand corner. And we are going to want to head over there. Though there is one other spot we want to head to first. Because back in the previous video at the church meeting, we learned that the, that the city council was planning something of a larger sweep of the nearby forest. And while I thought maybe, you know, there'd be no reason to even head over there, I get a feeling after that town meeting, it, it might be good to see if we can get some more information from anybody, you know, waiting to start the sweep. The problem is that it's not going to start for a little bit, and there's not too much to do for, I'd say, about 20 in-game minutes, and that's kind of one of the drawbacks of the game. Sometimes you're just in a, a mad rush to make sure and you meet certain criteria, and other times there's just kind of dead zones where you, you kind of have to just wait around. It doesn't have the, the nice feature of deadly premonition where you could smoke a cigarette and just kind of fast forward through time. But yeah, the next place we want to head is basically on the way to Cohen's house, but a little bit further north. If we continue following the, the road upwards, along this icy river, which we don't want to careen off into, we are going to find the entrance to the large forest here, which is Barrow's Forest. And we can already see that some people are gathering to start the search. In fact, the very first person to come here is the primary person we want to be talking to. And that is Sheriff Morgan. Yeah, the hope here is that with some of the information we've gathered, Morgan might be a little bit more forthcoming about some of the information he might have gathered. In this case, we want to convey the fact that Mel did tell us that Emma said she was on the way to the church, and yeah, Morgan seems to say that does make sense, especially in the case if Emma and Kathy were together. So we're definitely on the same page there. And I don't know. I, I don't really see Emma and Kathy hanging out with Mel. I guess he could have followed them. Uh, that'd be a bit creepy, but is that within the realm of possibility, especially Morgan seems to sense that Mel is hiding something. The problem is, for right now, Mel technically does have an alibi to go off of. He says that he was at the local bar pretty much all night, I guess. And yeah, bar wolves is something we have heard before back in the prologue. Dr. James mentioned that we should go meet him at 8 at the Bar Wolves. And while I, I guess Mel wasn't very forthcoming about the fact that he was maybe doing some underage drinking at the local bar, I, I guess there are some other bar patrons that seem to, you know, go along with his alibi, so he is not totally a suspect in all that just yet. Yeah, we get to the real meat of the situation here, and the fact that we did overhear during that city council meeting that there were some choke marks on Kathy's neck, and that yeah, that does turn out to be what was the suspicious, you know, evidence in you know Kathy's you know, death, I suppose, or Kathy's uh, body when she was found in the forest. And it, it, it's a bit much to jump to the conclusion that. She was choked in the attempt to take her life. It could could have been something else, I guess. Uh, Autoerotic asphyxiation or something like that. But it does seem that uh, Dr. Samuel doesn't think that the choking led in any way to her death. He, I mean, that's pretty much shock. I don't... 
we don't assume at this point that the choking led to the shock. It's probably more like still the bear attack and everything. But yeah, it's still, it's, there's still the mystery of who might have choked her. It's just that Morgan's not really going to work on that angle just yet. Don't want to turn this into attempted murder on just a bit of choking. Though I find it hard to put too much salt behind Morgan here. I don't think he's a hardened detective with a whole lot of background in solving murder cases. And yeah, we did talk to Cohen. He gave us that scary story about the strange weather that evening and the fact that Kathy might have been with someone that evening. I think that's how we came under the impression all in all that it might have been Emma who was with Kathy. And Morgan does give this possible hypothesis about what could have happened that night, that to stay warm, Emma and Kathy might have started a fire and that attracted a bear and that bear was angry from not being able to hibernate and attack them. It still seems a bit of a stretch, though, yeah, Matthew just kind of, kind of goes along with it. Still doesn't explain the whole thing about why they were in the forest together, why they were hanging out. There's there's a whole lot of head scratchers in this. It's not just the fact that Emma is still missing. Yeah, while I would like to join in the sweep of the forest, they definitely are not going to allow Matthew to do that. And instead, we are going to head further south along the road down to the Aston Farm. I mean, I still have a lot of general suspicions regarding Mel at this point. And I think if we can, it'd be good to investigate the Aston household. Also, while we head down the road here, I really want to emphasize the fact that being on a PS1 game... This was a, a bit of a technological amazement to me. Just uh, the fact that it's an active open world, there's things going on all around us off screen, like on timers, there's there's just, you know, buildings and things we can see in the foreground, even though they are kind of popping in and out of existence. It's it's very impressive for, for something like the PS1. I'm surprised they could get as much out of this as they could. Just like that, we've had we've made our way down to the palatial Aston Manor. And just like Lorraine said, there does seem to be something of a protest going on. I mean, at this point, it, it is still something of a peaceful protest where the workers want their their housing refurbished. But yeah, as, as you can imagine, the, the capitalist fat cats won't listen to the workers. And I'm assuming that none of these guys are in a union, so this is pretty much the extent that they're going to be able to put their demands forward. And yeah, the lodgings are in a pretty bad state. The water is going dry, the electricity just goes off at random, and considering where they are right now in this, you know, bleak cold winter, those can be life or death types of situations. I mean, if you're just in a wood cabin with no real heating or water, yeah, you can probably easily freeze overnight. Looks like Dennis is finally willing to talk to the protesters. And it does appear that, well, the the primary source of economy in the local area, much like in Twin Peaks, is this one centralized farm slash lumber mill here. And that's pretty much the extent of his characterization. He is just the the rich and powerful 
you know, capitalist in town. And while he feels that he has been doing enough to, you know, upkeep the lodgings, the workers have a completely different sentiment. And indeed, some of them feel that having worked for so long for the company, they deserve more than just a crappy little shack out in the middle of nowhere. Dennis, though, is definitely full of excuses. He thinks that they should just be happy with what they have and understand that completely rebuilding their lodgings is going to be a tremendous ordeal. Strangely, the workers do mention that in the darkness sometimes they, they do feel like there's a suspicious person wandering up around the lodgings, which is something to keep in mind, though. Uh, if anything, at least Dennis is willing to consider everything, and that's... That's enough to placate these workers. I mean, they're strangely a very trusting lot, I guess. And yeah, it's with that one small gesture that the workers are more than happy to leave and, I guess, go, go freeze up in their cabins. And from the workers, he, he does kind of give a little bit of attention to us. And with these protesters gone, that does mean that we can, we can get in a little bit of personal time with Dennis. Hopefully he's, uh, he's kind of uh, agree more agreeable to us. Sadly, that's not really the case. He, he goes from being somewhat personable to... What the fuck do you want? Sadly, it doesn't seem that he has a very great relationship with Mel. He doesn't seem to give the impression that he gives much of a shit about what or where Mel might be. He does at least give us some directions to Mel's room off to the side of the house. Beyond that, though, he has absolutely no time for any of Matthew's questioning or interrogation. Especially when it comes back down to the workers' lodgings. He definitely, much like Mel, has had enough of our questions. Which is fine with us, we're not really here to talk to Dennis. We don't... We don't have any real suspicions about him outside of the fact that he is probably not a very great boss. Or a very nice human being at all. Seems like irritability runs in the Aston family bloodline. Now that we have pretty much carte blanche to go check out Mel's room, first things first sure no one is in there. Because, as you can imagine, Mel being in here might make our sleuthing a little bit more difficult. Though the state of the room is probably not going to do us any favors either. Man, this place is a pigsty. But amongst all the motorcycle posters and magazines, there is one point of interest to us, right under the table here. It's a mysterious note that mentions something about the motel at 9pm. Seems kind of strange for someone living within the town to rent a motel room, unless they were having some, I don't know, illicit liaison. But before we can even consider any of that, things have gone from bad to worse. We find ourselves cornered in Mel's room. He is definitely going to come down here to answer that phone, so we need to find somewhere to hide. Toot sweet. The 
best place to do that, and the only place to do that, to do that is in this closet here. Being in this closet, though, does give us a nice vantage point to this one-sided conversation between Mel and a mysterious figure. And what is this Emma problem that he mentions? And how did he deal with it? That's definitely something to keep in mind going forward as we continue to suspect Mel and Mel. We also learn that whoever he is talking to, he's going to have a meeting with them tomorrow at 9 p.m. in the cemetery, so we'll make a mental note of that. close. And we nar narrowly managed to uh, miss getting found inside the closet here. And yeah, Dennis manages to, to save us yet again by allowing us out and getting Mel out of the room proper. But with that little bit of danger out of the way, we did get a pretty informative clue regarding Emma and Mel. There definitely was some connection, maybe with Emma's disappearance and Mel's weird behavior, but... Yeah, with all that out of the way, ooh, my heart is just racing after all that excitement. I think we need to head back to home base and do a little bit of relaxing. And occasionally, you know, Matthew does get a little bit of mail here at home, though usually it is a bit of junk mail. In this case, though, it is a helpful piece of junk mail because it gives us the phone number to the local auto garage. Yeah, there are times occasionally when the VW will get stuck out in the middle of nowhere or stuck in a snowbank. And by calling that number, we can have the car easily transported to a number of set locations in town. thing is, at this point, that we actually do have a number of different you know, people we could call and different phone numbers and things like that, but how are we going to keep track of all those? Well, that is why there is this notebook hidden away inside of Matthew's room here. Yeah, the notebook is a pretty helpful item all around. Allows us to keep tabs on a number of different, you know, story features and things like that. Now the the two two things that the notebook will allow us to do is one, to keep track of any kind of character information that we get over the course of the story, but it also records all the phone numbers that we'll manage to collect over time. This includes the sheriff's number, you know, Winona's number, and in this case the you know, the auto garage that we just got. And almost unnecessarily, maybe assuming that the player has not accessed their inventory just yet, we get a quick little tutorial on that. The nice thing is, though, that the notebook will update with any new information we get over the course of the game. 
And in addition to that, uh, any phone number we find will get automatically recorded. Though it does say after successfully connecting a call, but it seems more like if we read it anywhere, it just gets automatically appended into the notebook. And yeah, the, the notebook can be a pretty useful feature when you're playing through the game. There's a whole lot of characters and phone numbers to keep track of. I mean, at this point, we're a little bit halfway through the first day out of the game. And yeah, I'd say we probably already met 10 major characters or more. They each have their own individual backstories and places we need to meet them, etc. And... Yeah, already got a handful of different phone numbers that we can call. But I'll be keeping keeping updated with that, you know, just through normal gameplay, so we probably won't be looking at the notebook anymore. But the one other useful feature of Matthew's room is the bed here. Because, well, it's where we save our game and where we can also force time a little bit forward. Yeah, we can increase it by an hour or up to five hours. Though in this case, I think we've done enough, enough sleuthing for right now, so I think we're going to take a little hour nap, and hopefully you'll join me next time as we continue and finish up the first day. See you then.